Um, Sheikh Yasser, what would be your advice is to newly married couples, those who have been married for a while, how can they ensure that they maintain that love and affection, of course, in light of this own nature? You want to answer within two minutes? <laughs> You have, inshallah, yeah, 10 minutes. 10 minutes to solve all the marital problems. We have 10 minutes, mashallah. Look, dear Muslims, couples, married and to be married. Allah Azza wa Jal could have willed that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have a perfect marriage without any marital dispute. Allah could have willed that. But when you read the seerah, you find that the best human being ever created in human history and the best wives ever made for any prophet وسلم, even they had marital disputes. I know maybe some of you who haven't read the seerah will be shocked at this, but it's in Bukhari and Muslim. It's in every book of seerah. Allah revealed Quran about marital disputes between the Prophet and his wives. If Allah had willed, couldn't he have blessed him وسلم, to have a marriage that doesn't have any issues whatsoever, couldn't he? But see, if he had done that, it would not have been a human marriage. It would not have been a marriage that we can look up to as a role model. It would have been an angelic marriage. And how is that going to be beneficial to us? The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that even the best human being have marital issues that we have in the books of seerah and, 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 and hadith recorded minor arguments, right? So much so that Hafsa radiallahu anha, when Umar ibn Khattab came, and uh, he was having an argument with his wife, right? Hafsa's mother. And uh, she raised his voice against Umar. She raised her voice against Umar ibn Khattab, right? And Umar was used to a different type of woman. And he said, you dare raise your voice against me? You know what Umar's wife said? She said, who do you think you are? Your own daughter raises her own voice to the Prophet Sallallahu So Umar lost it and he went straight to Hafsa's house Radiallahu Anhu. And he said, is it true what I'm hearing? That you dare raise your voice against or above the voice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she's like, it's not just me, it's Aisha as well. I mean, like we're all doing this, you know, don't just come to me. Uh, it's a beautiful, like it's an interesting thing. And uh, uh, and these are all incidents reported in the books of hadith. Also, we have um, the famous uh, uh, incident of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an that. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq once came and uh, Aisha radiallahu anha was irritated for some reason. And again, these are the beauty of the narrators. They don't mention what these things are because that's not our business. These minor issues happen with anybody. It's not our business. But Aisha radiallahu anha was, uh, she was raising her voice and the process was sitting there quietly listening. And Abu Bakr happened to come in when she was you know, raising her voice. And, and he, he overreacted, maybe as a father, he raised his hand and he was about to, it's his own daughter. He raised his hand, he said, Are you daring raising your voice against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Like, how dare you do this? When she saw her father raise his hand, right? The hadith says, she ran behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Because she knew the hand would go down, okay? Notice the irony here. She's getting angry at the Prophet Sallallahu Then who does she turn to for protection? She goes to the Prophet for protection, right? And now that, now that Abu Bakr is like the hand is raised, he puts it down and he walks out in anger because he doesn't say anything. And then he comes back in 10, 20 minutes and he hears the two of them laughing and joking now. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, I came in and you were fighting with one another. Now I come in and you're laughing and joking. What's going on here? Like, and this is marital life, isn't it, right? This is marital life. Those of you that are not married, I will tell you as a married person, the best moments of your life and also the most painful moments of your life will come from your partner. This is the reality of married life. The sweetest and also the most bitter. Why? Because that's your life partner. That's the one you're spending your life with. That's the one who's going to be the mother or the father of your children. You're spending decades with them. This is the one you love the most. As the Prophet ﷺ said, who do you love the most? He said, my wife Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. I love my wife Aisha the most. So. What can be said? So much is there to say. Unfortunately, those that are not married, they get most of their marital views from movies and drama and television. And they have very 
very idealistic, utopic understandings of marriage. And to compound the issue, us Muslims have a double worse. We have a double whammy, okay? We, we are, firstly, obviously from our culture and Muslim heritage, we have certain understandings of, of, of gender and gender roles, right? And whether we like it or not, we are influenced by our cultures, in positive and the negative. There are some negatives, I have to say as well, but our culture influences us. But we're also a product of the broader and Western culture. And so we are battling between gender roles of our parents and gender roles of Hollywood, right? And the fact of the matter is, and I'll be brutally honest, when we get married, we ourselves are not fully sure what we want those gender roles to be in a marriage. And only a marriage itself will tell us ourselves. Many of you will be surprised when you actually get married, you will want to be more traditional. You think you don't, both men and women, by the way, right? You think you don't because you think Hollywood is telling you this idealistic notion of gender and equity and equality and whatnot. And when you get married, the world, Allah will teach you, your fitrah will teach you. There is a role for a man and a role for a woman. The two roles are complementary together, right? That, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنثَى This is something you learn the hard way. When you're 19 years old, you can argue as much as you want. When you're 29, when you have a child, you realize, look, I have a role and I have something to do and my partner has a role and he or she has something to do. We have a different role to play. It's not a matter of positive or negative. It's not a matter of which role is more important. It's like, I can't do what she can do. She can't do what I can do and vice versa, right? وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنثَى The man is not like the woman. My point is when you're 19, you don't know that. And you think, oh, we are all this and that. And you get married and you have these unrealistic notions of marriage, of marital bliss. Let me be honest here of sex and sexuality, which is why one of my courses was on that issue as well. And you have an unrealistic notion of gender and gender roles. All I can say, the both of you, husband and wife, need to prioritize Allah and His Messenger. If you make Allah the goal rather than your egos, there's hope in your marriage. If the both of you are looking up, then insha'Allah ta'ala, it will draw your hearts together. But if the both of you remove sharia from the equation, remove the sunnah from the equation, remove Allah and His message from the equation, then egos become inflated. And subhanAllah, what can be said? One simple verse and then we'll move on to the last question. One simple verse. And this is by the way, this verse should give optimism to every couple, every couple. Allah promises in the Qur'an, إِنْ يُرِيدَ إِصْلَاحًا يُوَفِّقِ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمَا I cannot think of a more optimistic promise in the Qur'an for married couples. This is a promise from Allah that is enshrined in the Qur'an that we recite in our salawat. In you, it's about marriage. إِنْ يُرِيدَ إِصْلَاحًا when the husband and wife is fighting, they're having a big dispute, Allah says, if the both of them want reconciliation, if they both want to save the marriage, Allah will bring about the reconciliation. So, simple question. Do you, O partner or spouse, want to save the marriage? And does your partner want to save the marriage? If the answer is yes, the guarantee is there. Now, if one of you doesn't, and by the way, it has to be said, sometimes Allah has allowed that escape exit because it needs to be taken, the divorce escape exit, right? We also have to decriminalize or destigmatize divorce for a legitimate reason, with an underlying legitimate reason, abuse or whatnot. Yes, when that is happening and you're, 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 you're not living a normal life or there's abuse taking place, Allah has allowed that escape. You know when you board the plane and they go to the safety equipment and whatnot? I have never in my life, I have over a million miles in planes, I've never once ever had to follow the safety directions and I pray I never have to do that as long as I live. But I need to know those safety directions, don't I? I need to know the exits. I need to know it's there, and if I need to use them, they, they are there to be used. So we need to destigmatize divorce for a legitimate reason, but we also need to say divorce is the final resort. It's not the immediate one. You try to save the marriage. You try to make things work, and Allah has promised if the two of you are wanting to do that, Allah will bring it about. So generic advice is no time left. Generic advice, number one, prioritize Allah and His Messenger to the Sharia. Number two, open communication. Be frank. Do not expect your partner to read your mind. Sit down when things are good, when things are calmed down, and express 
in personal language. Personal language means I. Don't say you when you're talking to your spouse. Don't say you did this. Rather say, I felt hurt when this happened. You change the dynamics. You take it off. Because when you say you, it's the accusative. You did this instantaneously. I have to defend myself. No, no, I didn't do that. When you say, I felt hurt when I was neglected automatically you change the dynamics. And now the husband, especially if a woman uses, by the way, shouldn't say this too explicitly because husband, husbands are sitting here, but women, damsel in distress motif, use it, okay? That's what, uh, that's what, it, wallahi, this is true. These fairy tales, there's an element of human fitrah in there. Allah created men to protect women. That's what a man does. That's what a gentleman does. That's what a true man does. Allah created men to want to protect women. nisa So when a woman, rather than being accusative, becomes on the defensive side. I felt hurt when this happened. All of a sudden, you will see a gentleman, his demeanor changes. He becomes guilty because you were hurt. You innocent, innocent damsel and creature. I caused you. If you say you hurt me, automatically, I didn't do anything. That's accusative, right? So anyway, I don't want to teach too much because both genders are here. If you want to invite me for a special class where I teach the brothers what needs to be taught and the sisters, that's a separate thing. But can't give too many tactics away or else it won't work in, the, in a public setting. But inshallah. And then the third point, dua. Lots of dua. Make dua that Allah Azza wa Jal is muqallib al-qulub and He will bless each one of you to have a closer heart together, inshallah.